James Nyabuga Nyarike. Currently, I'm a scientist and a lecturer at Technical University of Kenya. So basically, I work at the Department of Biochemistry and Biotechnology. I was born in Nyamira County, and uh, I come from uh, Burabu Settlement Scheme. So basically, I was born from an area where uh, it was initially inhabited by the white settlers. And uh, I come from the large uh, Orenos family. And basically, in my family, I have eight siblings, where I happen to be the seventh sibling. And uh, what I can say about uh, my family. So the, the extent, the large extended family that I here I refer to the Orenos family. Basically, it's a large family whereby basically I'm James Nyabuga Nyarik, and uh, I inherited this name from my late hunger was basically a doctor. He was a medical doctor by the name James Nyabuga Nyarik. So when he died and uh, when I was born, my name, my, my name basically was adopted from my late hango. And I can say the family at large is made up of scientists. There are pharmacists in our family. We have nurses. We have uh, medical doctors in the family. We have uh, journalists. And of course, uh, we have some engineers in that family. And uh, basically, if I can give a brief background, I started my primary at uh, a school known as uh, Nyagacho Primary School, where I went up to class three. Then uh, I proceeded to another second across the border, that's in Bomet because I just come from exactly the, the border between Yamira County and the Bomet County. So class four and class five, I was in a primary school called Mogoyuek Primary School. And uh, it happened that um, my dad was very keen, especially in my education. After class five, my elder sister, who was, uh, who had the initial, who was just uh, from college, she was employed as a primary school teacher. And at that point, my dad uh, decided now that I have to move away from Wuyuek and join my sister at a primary in Yamira count. And basically, I moved directly from class five to class seven. So basically, I can say I didn't go through class six in my primary school. So from class five, I went to class seven. From class seven, then uh, I did my, I went to class eight where I did my Kenya you know, the KCBE. Then uh, from there, I joined the uh, KC school, which is known as, uh, formerly known as Government African School. And I went through the four years program where I scored my, I had an A minus of 79 points from KC school. I joined Egerton University, whereby it's at Egerton University, I enrolled uh, at the bachelor's degree in biochemistry. And uh, that program basically took me four years. And um, I can say that I started my master's immediately after finishing my exams, the second exams of my fourth year, that's 4.2. In other words, I didn't stay out for long. So after five days, I was given a provisional admission at the university. And in this point, I have to say is that uh, after my fourth year in, uh, in our family, I heard my hango was called uh, Professor Jason Nyariko Reno, who was then a KU lecturer. And uh, what I can say, what I didn't mention is that uh, at my first year at Egerton University during my first semester, I lost my dad. So my dad had died through the accident. So in that case, I was left in the hands of uh, my brothers and one of my uncles who happened to be a professor at Kenyatta University. And I have to say from the onset, at, after I finished my fourth year, it's the same hango was at KU who had sent me back to Egerton. So told me just, okay, you don't need to go and look for a job have been looking at the way you have been performing from your first year 
to fall there. So he told me, you can go and apply for provision admission. And uh, remember this point uh, is the fact that uh, even the 4.2 exams have not been marked. So basically I went back to Egerton University, I applied for the provision admission and uh, I was given the admission, so I started master's immediately, specializing in biochemistry still. So I have to say that I graduated during my second semester of my master's. So I graduated with a first class honors degree in biochemistry. And uh, after, in my second semester of my master's work, so basically I applied for for a scholarship and it was basically an in-country scholarship and this scholarship was still about uh, ECP at Kassaran so it was a scholarship from the World Federation of Scientists in Switzerland and uh, I went through the interview and uh, I was successful so basically I have to say is that my first scholarship for my academic work started in my second semester during my first year of my master's so I got that scholarship and basically from there, everything started moving on smoothly. And um, after, after my coursework, I had interest uh, basically looking at some of the neglected tropical diseases. And it was at that point that uh, I came in contact with another uh, lecturer at Egerton University who had just come from the United States of America. And uh, the gentleman, uh, his area of specialization was on uh, neuroscience. So I had a chat with him at that point. So basically tell me, okay, what area do you really want to work on? So I, I had decided, okay, can I just try on this neglected tropical disease, uh, which is basically human African trypanosomiasis. And at that point, I had to develop quickly a proposal and uh, I worked with this gentleman and uh, that took me like two months. And uh, within that period, so basically I had to, you know, to apply for a grant from, uh, from Davidge O, and so we submitted, uh, you know, our proposal. And within one month down the line, I was successful. That now we were awarded the six point five million that's the Kenyan shillings, and uh, from there I took off immediately with my proposal. Where I went to Kenya to Panasomiasis Research Center which is K3, currently it's called uh, Biotechnology Institute. And uh, in that case, so basically I was working on the role of coenzyme Q10. I'll talk about this coenzyme Q10. So basically it was an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant agent. So basically I was looking at the role of that uh, antioxidant agent in terms of uh, whether it can attenuate uh, the inflammatory responses and the severity associated with human African trypanosomiasis. So I enrolled in that, uh, in that institute and I took up uh, my project. Uh, then, uh, which basically I was working on an animal model and uh, within uh, five months, so basically I was done with that research project and I started writing my thesis at that point. And uh, I was able, out of my master's project, I have to say that I was able basically to develop, right? And to come up with three manuscripts, which are basically published, which you can always go online and read. And uh, I, my master's basically took me like one year, eight months. And uh, basically I had to graduate with that master's and uh, Secondary, I was uh, awarded uh, a vice chancellor's honor award during that graduation because uh, a vice chancellor's honor award at Egerton University by that time was being awarded to master students, especially number one, you have to finish within the two years uh, window period for a master's program. And at the same time, another factor they were considering during that time was the fact that uh, any student 
who was to receive the vice chancellor's honor award you must be able at least uh, during your coursework you should have scored something like not less than a b so basically they are awarding us 75 points of not less than a b in other words it means in that case majority of the coursework you should score more a's In fact, uh, there's a couple of, uh, one individual who influenced me to sense, as I've said, is, uh, is my hunger. In fact, he passed like one month ago, the late uh, Professor Jason Yariko Reno. Himself, he was a scholar and uh, he was an historian, but uh, he, had, uh, he had ambition for anyone who wanted to do science. He, will, he was always great to support the individual. My hunger was the, was the period for me to venture in science. Another person was uh, my brother. I have a brother in the United States of America who has basically gone through all to the PhD program, also in the scientific discipline. And uh, the two guys, uh, basically, as I've said, they critically monitored my academic progress through my primary to the second, and they told me, look here, gentlemen, from what we see, you can make a great scientist. And uh, in fact, even after my high school, they told me, why don't you go and do biochemistry? And I can tell you after my high school, I just uh, had to select biochemistry, biochemistry, and in fact, like, uh, as I've said, my late uh, Hango was a professor because he himself started teaching at Egerton before he went to KU. And he told me, no, you just go to Egerton and it's a good area. So basically, the two were very fundamental in shaped me to accept, to appreciate, to develop passion for science, especially in biochemistry. And uh, secondly, as I can say, my main supervisor during my master's work, especially Pro Professor Alfred Isaac Orina was also very instrumental because the gentleman who has come from the United States of America and he was there to support me. So basically the three individuals developed, uh, you know, they made me indeed really appreciate and accept and develop passion for science. And I took it positively and I have to say that uh, from there, I've never looked back. So uh, what I can say after graduating from Egerton University, as I've said, during my graduation, I was awarded the Vice Chancellor's Honor Award before I was awarded my master's. And uh, during the graduation, so basically because I was seated on the forefront, uh, I think there was uh, one uh, professor from Mount Kenya University during the graduation. So basically this gentleman just came straight to me and he had a chat with me and they told me, okay, can I get your contacts? So basically after one week, I was uh, invited for an interview at Mount Kenya University because by then they were starting the School of Medicine. And in that case, basically, they really wanted to have a medical biochemist in that department. So I went to MKU, I faced the panel, I did the interview, and uh, during uh, the interview, I was, of course, uh, successive. And uh, what happened is the fact that uh, during that interview, also, there was uh, another professor from the School of Medicine at the Kenya Methodist University. Also, he was in the interview because uh, he was an invited panelist. Because also, they were interviewing people who were, you know, who wanted promotion to full professors and associate professors. So I remember very well. I did an interview. It was in the year 2014. The day I can say it was like on a Friday. So even before I received the, you know. The appointment letter from Mount Kenya University. Also, immediately on that Monday, I received a call from Kem, but the same professor was also in that panel. He invited me to Kenya Methodist. And so when I went to Kenya Methodist, we had a child. He told me, you know, you attended that panel and I was impressed with you. So, in other words, now here things have changed now from Mount Kenya University 
to Kenya Methodist University School of Medicine. So basically, after he convinced me, so basically I took up the job at the Kenya Methodist University. And uh, it's at Kenya Methodist University because also you have to know when you're working, you have to check who's giving a good offer. So basically the, the offer that came from Kenya Methodist University was so good. So basically in that case, I was, uh, I was uh, involved in, uh, you know, in teaching both medical students to the nursing students, the clinical medical students to the pharmacists. So I have to say that I worked at Kenya Methodist University <coughs> for four months. Then uh, because I really had an ambition that I really wanted uh, to progress to my, to my PhD. But at the same time, <coughs> I also applied for a position of an assistant lecturer at the Technical University of Kenya in which also as I was working at came, they invited me for an interview. So basically after I became again successful at the Technical University of Kenya, so I said, now it's high time for me to move from a private entity to the public institution. So the next thing was to tender my resignation at the Kenya Methodist University. And uh, that's when I moved from now, came to the Technical University at the Department of Biochemistry and Biotechnology. Okay, thank you. My main mentor, especially now after I landed in Took, I have to say that in Took, I only worked there for four months before I proceeded to German for my doctorate degree. So when I landed in, uh, when I landed in Took, when I landed in Technical University of Kenya, it's that took now again where I met my former supervisor for my master's work, Professor Isaac Orina. Then from that point again, um, he told me now, since now you have been enrolled here, so basically it's high time for you to go on for your studies. And at the same time, I was always in contact with my brother, was basically a good mentor, always motivated me that it's good to do science, you are a pride guy. So at that point, uh, I really wanted to go to the United States of America to pursue for my doctorate. So basically I was preparing to do the graduate record examination. And, the, and at the same point, because also I really wanted to have a solution to malaria, I started reading a little bit more on cerebral malaria in conjunction with the Professor Orina. Then at that point, uh, I had, uh, I really wanted also to go to German because uh, when I was interacting with Professor Orina, there was also another lecturer now at the University of Nairobi called Dr. Mecha. He just came and said, hey, look here, guy, why don't you go out and get a new settings so that now you can get a new experience so at that point, I just started looking for professors across the German uh, institutions. I would go to the website to see people who are working on tropical diseases. I would write good concept. In fact, I have to say that I made almost 50 applications across the universities in German. I was so lucky that uh, one guy had to reply, was working on cerebral malaria. And at that point, so basically I had to write a proposal, put in everything with the encouragement of Professor Rina, then uh, I had now to proceed through a DAD scholarship at uh, the University Hospital of Bonn, where basically I worked on cerebral malaria. So these guys, they were always instrumental to me, like especially I can say Professor Isaac Rina, the guy who was always in touch with me, together with my late hunger, they will always contact me. They will tell me, look here, we don't need anything less than a doctorate degree. And the best career, they always encouraged me. They told me things might not be easy as you might think, but the most important thing is that uh, just uh, go compose yourself, work hard, and uh, they told me just within three years, uh, you will have your program. So basically I took in their words and I was always in touch with them because even back at, even when I landed in German back at home, there was some work we were doing. So basically we always interact, they will always encourage me. 
and uh, at also when I landed in German, I have to say that I met also another postdoc student. One postdoc student was coming from uh, India. There was another postdoc student from Jamaica. During my interaction, you know, with them, they are postdoc students. I'm a doctorate student. So the guys will always encourage me to tell me how to, why it's good to read everywhere, read everything. They will tell me about the future of science. They will always encourage me why I should be part of the solution to challenges facing African countries. So basically, these guys, they will always work with me. They will show you techniques. They will tell you the directions you will always take in research. And they will always tell me, look, for example, like in Africa, doctorate programs, they can take like 10 or so years. Here, if you are committed and you make, you know, you consult widely, things will always work. So it starts when at Yemen, I took only two years, eight months to get my doctorate. So basically, in terms of mentorship, starting from my hunger, from my Prato, from uh, Professor Isaac Corina, to the postdoc students, always, it, it caught into my nerves. It was a great encouragement. It's something that made me to appreciate and to move on to read until I became one of the best presenters, especially when it comes to presenting scientific work in our journal crops, in the science crops, in the university. So in terms of uh, mentorship, it's, uh, I can say mentorship is a very important program, which always should be taken seriously, especially to those people who have excelled in specific field and specific areas. This is very critical is because uh, I have to say like back here home at, in Kenya, we are very bright, uh, we are very bright students. And uh, we have first class honor students. We have those students who have uh, scored second class upper division. There's some specific information that they really need to be fed with. You need somebody to create a, a friendly environment and such friendly environment. So basically we always open avenues for the other so that uh, at the end we form what we call a cohort kind of network. So basically, which will help our young, vibrant coming scientists to take up the mantle from where others have left. So basically mentorship, as I can see, is a very critical program where we need to share such kind of information. For example, I can say from, if I can tell you from my experience in terms of mentorship, is in relation to the in university where I work, I can, uh, I can give two or three critical examples. So basically, like, for example, when I came from German, I, I landed in Tuk. When I came and I found like two students who have finished coursework, they were just hanging there. They have no projects. Just came and told them, no, take heart. These things will work. I told them how to approach. I sat with them. We worked them together. Finally, they were able to graduate. And uh, from there, I was able, oh, there's one guy who's very sharp. I told this guy, you don't need to waste time just uh, come and we develop ideas so that you can go out and get experience. So this, uh, this, this gentleman, I sat with him, he took my work seriously and uh, currently is pursuing his uh, doctorate uh, in cellular and molecular immunology in Hungary. So basically he's doing that. And um, I've also like, uh, I'm always, encouraging a number of students. Whenever they come, I, I write a number of recommendations. Also, there's another student from Tuk who's currently pursuing her master's uh, with this Pan-African University scholarship. So this is one of the students during my undergraduate whom I worked together. I brought them on board in my project. I'm also happy to report here that one of your one of your colleagues here, Varad Kimtai, was also the, that lady I, I mentored during her for the especially she worked under my projects. So these mentorship programs, if you come like in Tuk nowadays, I have my own uh, research progress uh, club where I bring in young scientists, uh, not only from Tuk, we have scientists, young postgraduate students who come from KU, you have some from Chequat two weeks ago. 
there's two who joined us from University of Nairobi. It's a third point basically where we discuss science, we tell them the future of science, why they really need to work hard. We, you know, we tell them the pros and don'ts of the, you know, of science. So mentorship, as I can say, is a very critical problem because uh, it opens up. Students, young scientists really need to know exactly what's expected of them, especially after they finalize their undergraduate studies. I have a number of research currently I'm working on. So basically I want to highlight them quickly. So one of the research basically currently I'm working on, and basically if you can go, you can even Google score, you can get all the publication. So the fun thing is that uh, we have been working on our research, uh, looking at the neurotoxicity effects of cut, cut is basically mirror. So in this case, uh, we have been looking on how cut basically can affect the central nervous system, looking at the inflammation, the exacerbation and the effects associated with it. And at the same time, we use, we have been using some uh, anti-inflammatory agents to assist in terms of uh, especially those uh, individuals who are being exposed, who have been chewing this mirror for quite a long time. And uh, just a brief summary from what we found out from this research is basically chewing mirror causes a lot of uh, damage to the fighter organs from uh, the kidney to the liver. Also, we, we found that it can cause a lot of, uh, you know, it has uh, it's, it's a, a high potent neurotox compound or agent and uh, the good thing is that uh, we try to bring in some anti-inflammatory agent to try to ameliorate the same and have to report that uh, that anti-inflammatory agents uh, has really worked well and this work has been uh, going on so basically being carried out by one of our postgraduate students and from this work, basically, we have published like two papers. And what I can say from it now to the society, we are warning in as much as I know it will bring in a lot of political tension because uh, Mira or cut is usually associated with uh, some e economics. So it's an economy, something that really people like uh, in Meru and other region, Eastern, let's call it Eastern part of Kenya. It's really very important in terms of uh, basically in terms of finances, generating income, and it's part of how the Kenya can develop the economy. But uh, in terms of what we want to say that chewing mirror in terms of health is not a good thing. That's the first research. The second uh, research we work on is on uh, human human African trypanosomiasis, which is basically a neglected tropical disease. And uh, in this case, basically we work on animal models where we use Swiss white mice. And then this the study I've been going on because it formed the base of myself from when I was uh, in my undergraduate and from my master's work. And uh, this study basically, as I'm saying, currently we are also working on a compound known as coenzyme Q10 to see in the presence of this compound with the dry coal mirasopro, what is the fact that uh, the current uh, and uh, the current uh, drug that's used to treat uh, human African dipanosomiasis uh, is usually highly toxic. And uh, in most cases, uh, if you treat, let's say, like 20 patients, you are very sure that two will die. So basically, we are using this concept Q10 in conjunction with this Mirasopro to see how they will improve treatment outcomes. So basically, looking at the developing countries, like in Kenya, so basically we want to come up with an alternative and a better treatment, so basically to deal with this neglected tropical disease. And another aspect, uh, kind of what research also I'm working on is on uh, human cerebral malaria. As you are very, uh, very much aware is that uh, cerebral malaria is basically a severe form of malaria, which is the complicated form. And uh, currently there is uh, emergence of resistance uh, against uh, this artemisinin based combination therapy with those uh, rumefantrin. And uh, this case have been reported uh, in uh, Southern Asia. Recently, they have been reported in uh, Rwanda. And uh, 
basically i'm developing this study from from my doctorate degree because also in doctorate degree i really did a lot of characterization of inflammatory mediators associated with uh, human cerebral malaria and uh, currently i'm working on a combination therapy a therapy that basically looking at the role of again question q10 together with chloroquine to see if we can bring in chloroquine together with this concern q10 so that we can shut down and improve the treatment outcome during human uh, human cerebral malaria and uh, i have to report is that uh, this work uh, is progressing well and this is the kind of research so basically which is being undertaken by another postgraduate doctorate student and uh, so basically i'm looking forward that uh, at the end of the day we'd be we'd form part of the solution to dealing and the prevention of this uh, cerebral malaria because uh, what we know if you look at the WHO reports clear like uh, the 2020 report says that uh, over 229 million people worldwide globally where they, they suffered from malaria. And out of that, uh, we had almost uh, 405,000 individuals dying from malaria. So basically, malaria continues uh, causing high morbidity and mortality rates. So basically, we want to be part of the uh, solutions to dealing with this uh, malaria menace in the society. And uh, another aspect of uh, my research study, we work on uh, toxicological studies, especially we are looking at, uh, for example, you have been hearing cases uh, in which uh, like uh, people went to the pound, like when they are taking liquor, when they are enjoying their peer, the, the peer is usually spiked with some drugs, just call them sedative drugs like uh, solibidum, midazolam. So basically we are looking at the detrimental and deleterious effects of spiking alcohol, how they basically can affect is those conditions being exacerbated whereby you have spiked alcohol. So that's another study which was formally carried out by a postgraduate, a student who has already graduated with a master's, but still I'm continuing with the same studies now looking at the, the effect, especially at the molecular level, so that now we can warn, so that now we can give some further recommendation to the Minister of Health, so that now people can be really punished because uh, we have seen that spiking those alcohol with those materials, not only that's very important to people in terms of committing crime, but in terms of health, it has far-reaching consequences. And uh, also another study, another toxicological studies that uh, I'm currently carrying out in the lab is uh, you have had also some cases that have been reported that this with uh, you know where we have seen uh, people who are doing, who are in business in terms of uh, selling these bananas where they use some chemicals like calcium carbide we have uh, these individuals in the butchery where they use uh, high levels of sodium metabisulfide to preserve their meat so basically we want to profile some toxicological biomarkers which basically might be detrimental to the health of individuals especially if they consume such kind of chemicals so basically as you can see now we work on those toxicological studies and uh, and another study which i have already carried out in this study i do it in conjunction with the scientists at the institute of primate research where we have developed what we call a successive baboon model, whereby we want to understand cholera in young children. How does cholera develop? Because we really don't have a proper model. And I have to say is that we have really developed a model which can be used to study cholera in young children. So basically using those uh, cryptosporidium, PAFA as a causative agent uh, of cholera in young children. And the finally, we are also now, because we are in the era of COVID, and uh, there's also another study we are carrying out at the Institute of Primate Research, where we have challenged 
the baboon. So basically we are using a baboon model in order to understand the molecular pathogenesis of COVID, looking at the number of vital organs that are being involved apart from the lungs, because we know it's the lungs, because they have those angiotensin converting enzymes, which are basically the receptors for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But in this case, we want we have been we have already started the experiment. We have we have challenged the baboon models to understand how the disease developed in a systemic manner so that now we can uh, understand the molecular pathogenesis. And at the same time, we are also trying up, we have a vaccine, yes, but also can we have some of the anti-inflammatory agents that basically can be used against uh, this uh, COVID-19. So sometimes uh, probably the mistake uh, are made, and basically this uh, has been pointed out probably from some of my colleagues, some, some of my colleagues, sometimes they see that I should have gone completely out of science and go and pursue medicine. And uh, I think uh, when, I, when, I, when I did my KCSC from, uh, from KC school, during that era, in fact, I had the real points which could have uh, landed me in a, in a medicine class, but I didn't want that. But uh, in all the interactions, sometimes when I see the kind of misdiagnosis, uh, people not treated, because when I work with this cerebral malaria, a number of uh, diseases, sometimes I really feel strong that, uh, yes, I'm needing well sounds, but I should have gone to the medical field. And in that medical field, so basically, sometimes I could have uh, really taken a different route. But uh, basically, I might say maybe I was under the influence of some people. Probably, like, uh, sometimes when I go to the field, some of the easiest uh, kind of conditions, so basically that can be really treatable. You find that many individuals, like in the villages, are, are dying. And here now, I'm back in the city doing my science uh, elsewhere. So the mistake I made is probably, I might be forgiven, I didn't go to the medical school. <clears throat> and uh, basically, because that was my real passion for my, my dad, but I took a different direction. But nevertheless, I might have taken that mistake. But what I can say in life, like people do make certain mistakes and uh, some of the mistakes always can be corrected. But uh, if you have run out of time at some point, they cannot be corrected. But uh, if you find yourself in a specific area, you have to continuously pursue that area to the level of your pace. And uh, one also of the mistakes I can say I committed at some point is that uh, sometimes probably I could have been a pet and a greater sense than the way I am. Like uh, I was awarded a postdoc position at Maryland University in the United States of America. I turned down that position. And basically that position was supposed now to prepare me even to be a better science than the way I am. Nevertheless, so basically sometimes if you, if you get certain opportunities, I can tell individuals, always do your best. You can talk, take those opportunities after consulting, uh, you know, further. So I didn't do a lot of consultations but uh, I took it as an individual person. I made my own decisions, I ran away from it. So sometimes I feel strong that if I could have done my postdoc, I could have formed better international collaborations, which basically could now assisting, not only myself, could be assisting other young scientists uh, in our country. So, when we talk about mental health, we really need to distinguish between a mental health and uh, a mental disorder. So basically, mental health uh, is becoming uh, really quite uh, a very serious, especially when somebody develops uh, some mental disorders. And uh, basically, we talk about these mental disorders ranging from depression, from stress, and have to admit that uh, at some point, if you ask some of those individuals who have gone especially to Europe, 
And uh, in this case, uh, like when you are doing your doctorate program, I think at some point even me, I suffered from like a mental disorder, which I can call like I suffered from acute stress. In this case, I call it acute stress. It was not, a stress can be a positive or a negative stress. It can be a distress, it can be a eustress. And basically, basically I was suffering from an academic stress, which is a eustress. A situation where, you know, you are tasked, you are given a lot of work, you have to do, you have to produce results. It basically destabilizes your health, the way you function, you know, it can even lead to a situation. I have seen like, uh, I have to say that in Europe, especially during my academic journey, a number of people suffer from these mental disorders because of, they suffer from so much depression. You're working in the lab, you're not getting results and the metry that basically can disorient uh, individuals. You take uh, into consideration now back here home, Social distress can be some biological factors, so, social and uh, mental distress, mental health disorder, associated disorders can also be due to social and fin they have some due to financial implications. And basically, if we have a society which is suffering from mental disorders, just even from the scientific world, even the country at large, it means we are not going to have a functioning country a functioning society and uh, people will suffer from uh, bipolar related conditions people will suffer from those uh, uh, what you call phobia related uh, conditions and uh, in this case uh, mental disorder so basically will create a situation it it will cause some anarchy and chaotic in the country and therefore it means we not have a health working population and um, if you look at globally, mental health, if it goes unchecked, it's going to be really, really catastrophic because uh, what, we are, what we are seeing is a situation whereby we are going to have a population that's really, really not functioning. People are suffering from depression. And if you can take, for example, in, in the case of our country, a lot of murder cases are usually associated with depression. So people commit things uncontrollably. So mental health associated disorders, as I can say, they are highly catastrophic. And uh, if we look, if we project uh, to the year 2020, so basically they might also, they might also the main contributors of even uh, high mobility and mortality rates, even if we got the year 2050, uh, and if these things go unchecked, then it means uh, we're going to have uh, a society that's not properly functioning. People lack the confidence and all other kind of things. Thank you for your question, especially you are saying in the area of science. So basically, as I've said, uh, science is a promising field. And uh, there's quite uh, a number of opportunities. For instance, uh, we have uh, research institutions. And these research institutions, so basically they can absorb the best students. We have pharmaceutical companies. Basically pharmaceutical companies uh, that basically develop uh, drugs, uh, vaccines. Uh, and these pharmaceutical companies always, uh, they are in demand and they require noble and uh, high upcoming young scientists. So basically for myself, there are very good areas where we can pursue such opportunities. And I have to say there's uh, a lot of opportunities for scientists, especially in developed countries. The only thing is that uh, some individual, especially, for example, if you want to become a real scientist, you have to, you have, to have your postgraduate uh, degrees. And uh, if you go to America, Canada, German, there's always opportunities uh, for young upcoming scientists uh, who have taken their work seriously. For example, I can just say, say critical here, if you want to pursue like biochemistry, biotechnology, like in America, the only thing you need to do, take your time, go and do your graduate record examination, apply 
you get those opportunities to go and study and work in those countries. If you want to go to Germany, you need to check the websites, go across the German universities, just go to their website. They are looking ever for students who really want to work on those institutions. And of course, some of us uh, who come from these uh, public universities, what we know is that uh, universities, they tend sometimes uh, to retain their best students. If you graduate with the good first class honors, the university will always retain you as a graduate assistant so that uh, you can always be involved in uh, what you call a career and academic development programs. Also, even, even universal potential source of opportunities from research centers, from, uh, you know, from pharmaceutical companies. Also, we have um, these uh, companies that basically sell reagents, they sell equipment, they require science, they require biochemists, they companies that, which sells like, you know, like these PCR machines, they sell for cytometer. They want people who will go there and explain how they will, what such machines will work. So basically the opportunities are there. The only thing is that uh, people need to work from their comfort zone, explain them and interact with some of the people who have made it true. So basically my future prospect is that uh, we are really, really trying to develop uh, a really, really proper research forum and uh, with my colleagues uh, in TUC, especially with Professor Rina. So basically we want uh, to bring on board. We really want not, basically what we have planned for, especially for our postgraduate students, we want to attract the grants from malaria, from, uh, you know, even now we are venturing also into cancer. And we want to train some postgraduate students up to master's levels. And at that point also, we want to make sure that also they go out now to get new experience. So basically we are expanding our program. And the most important, I didn't mention it here that uh, in my small research uh, you know, program, we have uh, always won some uh, innovations for some products we are trying to develop basically even though it's uh, some little amount of money. And uh, with some of our innovations, we want to go further to see how basically we can deal with this uh, malaria menace. And uh, in that case, basically we want to broaden. We want to broaden our, you know, our research so that we can have collaborators from the international community so that they can make it even easy for us to have an exchange program for our students, especially from our small research program. So basically this one does not touch the institution. And uh, we have really competed, like uh, I have to say last week, we got some collaborators from, uh, one collaborator from Massachusetts University, where I was attending the advanced uh, immunology course, which I had won, uh, but as a small scientist from Africa. So ours is basically, we want to expand the horizons of our research forum so that we incorporate our students and from there so that we can have more students going outside there and basically what we are looking at is we really want to develop products not only training students but we want to develop products that can go to the pharmaceutical companies so that now they can help to alleviate all these uh, neglected tropical disease and other really tropical disease so that we can be part of that solution. It's a complex challenge that's really causing a lot of menace cropping because uh, if you check the average or statistics, <clears throat> they can tell you that uh, under microbial resistance, uh, the mortality, the death that's usually occurs uh, in every year is around 700,000. What does that one tells you? That if it goes unchecked in the next uh, third or so years, these cases can go up to 10 million. And uh, basically the question comes, what's really contributing this uh, antimicrobial resistance? As we know, when we talk about antimicrobials, we are talking about those viruses, we are talking about those fungus, we are talking about bacteria, we are talking about parasites. So basically the main contributors here is uh, misuse and uh, overuse 
of the antimicrobial. So any agent, so basically it may be antibiotics, may it be some antifungals, antivirals, and all those things. So misuse and overuse, so basically they become the main drivers apart from the normal you know, genetic mutation that are associated with it. So basically it means, also another main factor that also contributed to and microbial resistance uh, is the quality, is the quality of uh, drugs. So basically, in terms of quality, it has been compromised. The real active ingredients. So basically, as we talk about generic drugs. So in other words, people because of the economy, and when you look at all these factors compounding together, <clears throat> then it means that uh, we are really trading in a very dangerous ground, especially. I can tell you that uh, in terms of uh, clinical development of uh, new antimicrobials, it's running dry. There's lack of commitment. There's lack of uh, funding that's coming to deal with this menace. For example, like because also we work with some drug. Personally, I, di I didn't mention this one. I forgot to mention that uh, basically I have also another master student from KU who's working on use and misuse of antibiotics, especially on how they can perturb the normal gut microbiome, microbiome, sorry, and how that one contribute to affect the brain axis. And uh, I have to mention it here very clearly is that uh, like uh, for the previous uh, years, we had almost new clinical developments of antimicrobials which were coming out almost at six of them. But when all of them went to validation, it came out that it's only six, which tend to be more innovative. What does that one tell you? That if we keep on not following the proper procedures and guidelines in terms of use of this antimicrobial, microbial and, and mean even antibiotics, call them antifungals, antiparasitic agents, even in the face of these new ones which are being developed. So basically we are going to face these challenges. So in other words, the aspects in terms of uh, deaths and uh, mortality rates, so basically they are going to increase until we have a proper registration. There must be proper knowledge and guidance. So basically which must, we need legislation to control, especially like if you, if you go to most people's houses, you might think they have like a chemist in houses. Today you go and buy this antibiotic, tomorrow you move to another one. So in terms of antimicrobial resistance, it's with us, it's gonna be with us. So there are some, some legislation, some quality in terms of the standards that are associated with this uh, drug development must be factored in, especially in terms of ensuring that uh, all active ingredients must be properly adhered to. So it's going to be a big challenge. But uh, with good uh, funding and good innovative and research, we can overcome it. But uh, what I can say, it's going to be a big challenge especially in the face of, uh, you know, with this COVID, because now everyone is running away from any other research related. And microbial now everyone's talking about COVID because uh, COVID is like a hot cake current. Thank you.